Our first speaker today <clears throat> is Paul Eager. Paul is an environmental engineer with Global Minerals Engineering. He has over 40 years of experience dealing with environmental issues related to mining and water resources, both in the public and private sectors. His technical expertise focuses on water treatment, waste management, reclamation, and regulatory issues. So with that intro, we will turn it over to Paul. Thanks, Susie. How is the uh, audio? Does it seem to be okay? It's, you sound great, Paul. Okay. All right. Let me just pull up the presentation. All right. So is, is it, and I'm sharing my screen. Can everyone see my screen? Not yet. Oh, okay. Um, do I need to hit, I, I am technologically challenged here. So that's let me, a, that's let's okay. See. I, okay, I, um, all right, let's go back to the Zoom. Okay. Um, okay. I'm trying to figure out what is going on here. It says share screen and then something else comes up, Susie. I should probably, we probably should have tested this. I've <laughs> done this before, but uh, oh, it wants some kind of... There you go. Zoom. There you, you go. All right. Yeah. Okay, I don't want to leave the meeting. All right, I want to play the slideshow. Oh, now an auspicious start here. <laughs> That's okay, so. you're doing good. All right, how about that? Perfect. Hey, all right. Here's okay. that. <laughs> all right. <laughs> well, great. Well, thanks for being here this morning and, and to putting up with my technological incompetence. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, it's great, great to be able to talk to you folks. Uh, although I'm sure, as other speakers have said, boy, I'd much rather be in Montana than in my basement in Minnesota. But unfortunately, that's where a lot of us are <laughs> hanging out in in our proverbial caves uh, during this pandemic time. So I want to talk a little bit about kind of new uh, innovations in passive treatment. And before I jump in, I want to acknowledge my co-authors and partners in crime, uh, Jim Gusick from Lincoln Engineering and Peggy Jones and Doug Crean from American Peak Technology. Okay, just a little bit of overview of what I hope to cover this morning. Again, kind of give you a little bit of, of background about passive treatment. Uh, you know, I primarily work with metal mine drainage, and so that's what I'm going to focus on today. Talk a little bit about kind of the, kind of our standard approaches, which are the biochemical reactors and wetlands, and then talk about some of these new approaches and wrap it up and hopefully leave time for questions. All right, well, I'm going to just step back. I, I'm sure a lot of you know this, but it's always good to kind of do a quick review of the active versus passive treatment technology. So the active treatment options are kind of your standard big box, you know, treatment plants. And as an engineer, you know, I love this kind of stuff because, you know, today, especially with all the computerized controls, we can do almost anything and we can watch these things probably, you know, from our basements during a pandemic if we need to. But, you know, they're very expensive. They're, they have a lot of maintenance. It's a continual input of energy and chemicals, and you need staff there to make sure that things are operating correctly. So being basically lazy, particularly as I, I get lazier as I get older, it, I'm really in, into these passive treatment technologies because these don't require continual maintenance. They're not no maintenance, but they're definitely low maintenance systems. And what we do is we look at natural systems to try to mimic them and Primarily, we use gravity flow whenever possible. And kind of the poster child for passive treatments is the constructed treatment wetland. So, as I said in the beginning, the constructed treatment wetlands and the biochemical reactors have really been our staples for, for many years. Constructed treatment wetlands, actually, we began looking at those in the late 70s to early 80s. Biochemical reactors were about a decade later, the late 80s to the early 90s. So constructed treatment wetlands, we're really looking at horizontal flow across the surface, relatively shallow water depths of 6 to 12 inches, because we're focusing on aerobic processes. And really, 
although in, you'll see some examples here of, of treating acid drainage, it's really most effective for circumneutral water because you can get some pH modification in a wetland, but it's typically not going to bring you up to a discharge standard. And for trace metals, they're particularly effective at circumneutral pHs. So just talk a little bit about the history of these things um, in terms of ion removal. And again, we were looking at natural systems. This is a paper, Weeder and Lang were looking at coal mine drainage in West Virginia. And again, water was entering a natural wetland and what they saw was substantial removal of iron. The iron oxidizes, it precipitates, and then either settles out or is filtered by the vegetation. As you can see the iron here in this particular photo of the wetland. As I mentioned, it does not totally neutralize acid inputs. And when we look at designing these things, we come up with an aerial removal rate. And, and typical rates for constructive treatment wetlands for iron removal are on the 10 to 20 grams per iron per meter squared per day. Well, let's look at trace metal removals. So one of the first papers uh, on, of this was published back I, you know, about 40 years ago. <laughs> so I always, this always reminds me how long I've been doing this stuff. So, and the primary removal mechanism is interaction with organics. And again, this was another example of stockpile drainage containing trace metals entering a natural wetland. So there we see a much lower uh, removal of trace metals, 10 to 40 milligrams. So we're several orders of magnitude less than we're seeing for iron. But again, much lower concentrations of metals going in. So the biochemical reactors came along. And again, kind of some of the key papers on that period of time, Wildman and others, this is the big bio drainage tunnel. Uh, Jim Gusick, my co-author, worked on that study as well. And about the same time, the former US Bureau of Mines was doing a lot of work with coal mine drainage and started to experiment with this concept of, a, of essentially the biochemical reactor as well. So these are very different uh, than the constructive treatment wetlands. Uh, we are using an organic substrate, well, that's true. It's generally a mixture now uh, of a variety of different organic materials and including limestone. And I'll talk a little bit in a minute why we use the limestone. Uh, it's a vertical flow as opposed to horizontal flow and we're primarily relying on anaerobic processes. So one of the reasons that biochemical reactors have become so uh, powerful in the passive treatment arsenal is that they treat a wide range of pH anywhere from three to nine and they'll treat almost everything. They treat iron, aluminum, trace metals and also some of the anions like sulfate and selenite. So this is a microbial driven process and, and the little guys that do this are these little rod shaped bacteria, the sulfate reducing bacteria. They're very common, they're present in soil and they're particularly high concentrations in manure. So a lot of the early systems had a lot of manure in them. And they, what they do is they reduce the sulfate to sulfide. And to do that, they, they're pretty low maintenance. They need an oxygen free environment, some sulfate and some small chain organic carbon. So as I mentioned, I'm an engineer, so we always have to have a few equations in the presentation. And these are just kind of a simplified uh, explanation of how biochemical reactors work. So essentially, you know, the bacteria need the sulfate and a small chain organic carbon. They reduce the sulfate to sulfide, produce H2S and bicarbonate. The H2S or the sulfide before it forms H2S reacts with the metal to form an insoluble metal sulfide. So uh, what happens is that uh, you can see that this reaction does not produce any net positive alkalinity, but as this reaction occurs in excess of the metals, then we do produce alkalinity and increase our pH. However, we almost always include limestone in the mixture. And that basically as the calcium carbonate dissolves, it increases the pH and produces alkalinity. So in the nice part, you know, back in the early days, some of the other things that people try with passive treatment is, well, you know, limestone will neutralize acid. Let's just put it, you know, let's just run acid, acid mine drainage through it. And, and it works for a little while, but then the iron and the aluminum coat the limestone and plug the pores and soon you have no reactivity anymore. But this limestone's in an anaerobic environment and so you don't have that same kind of problem. 
So if there's not enough metal in solution, as I said, you have sulfate reduction, sulfate reduction occurring in excess, but sometimes that re, re, re basically releases H2S gas, which I think most of us know is the wonderful smell of rotten eggs. So for those of us who work in the field, that's the sign of success. Unfortunately, a lot of the site owners and nearby public don't really share that viewpoint. So another thing with the biochemical reactors, which are somewhat problematic, are what we call the nuisance parameters. So if any of you made coffee or tea, you know when you run water through an organic media, you get color. And when you run it through something particularly that has any amount of manure in it, you get some pretty stinky water with some pretty high BODs. And so we've cut back the amount of manure in our systems now to reduce this. But this is still a problem, and it, and it typically lasts for about three to six months. All right, so something I've been doing recently, particularly as part of the pandemic, is better living with alcohol. But we've been doing a lot of work with uh, what we call the bugs on booze. So, uh, you know, the sulfate reducing bacteria, are, they're kind of a lot like engineers. They like alcohol and sugar. And so if we provide that directly to them uh, in the form of ethanol or molasses, we can essentially provide those short, short chain organic compounds, which increases the rate of reaction by at least a factor of 10. And so you can get better treatment in a small area. And this is just a pilot study that I was involved in in Northern Minnesota uh, some time ago, where we were actually doing the bugs on boo treatment and, and got very good uh, sulfate reduction and treatment. So this is just a, a kind of a summary table, kind of, uh, you know, highlighting the things that, that I've said before. I don't think I need to spend a lot of time on it other than to point out that for both of these technologies, there is a well-documented guidance available and that's through the Interstate Technolo Technology Regulatory Council or ITRC. They have a wonderful website. Um, full, disclosure, this is full disclosure, I worked on both of these documents, so that's why I think they're so good. Uh, but they are, they are an excellent reference. And the other thing I want to point out about these, both of these technologies is that they typically require fairly long contact times of two days or more. But again, you know, there, there's a lot of benefits to these. They have been kind of, as I said, the staple of our passive treatment arsenal for many years. All right, well, let's uh, talk a little bit about what passive treatment is not. And it is not a silver bullet. You know, and certainly in the early days when everyone thought, you know, you could build wetlands and people wanted to put up basically a backyard wetland and treat 100 gallons per minute through it and found out that didn't work. So uh, there's not one treatment that's going to solve all your problems every time. What it really is, is more of a toolbox. And you've probably seen this analogy before for other, you know, parts of our technological world as well, where we have many tools and we just have to choose the right one because one size is, does not fit everything. And so again, everything is site specific. You have to know your site, you have to know your flows, your water chemistry, your limits, and your climate. What we're seeing more and more is that passive treatment has become a series of steps to achieve standards. And what well, the nice thing is that we can achieve water quality standards with this type of approach. And this is a, a Mare Ranch system. It's kind of one of the classic uh, passive treatment systems that was built by uh, one of my friends and colleagues, Bob Nair in Oklahoma at the university. And what we have here, the biochemical reactors are not, these are the third step. So essentially this first step is an oxidation pond to get rid of iron, wetlands to polish that iron, and then finally the wetland treatment systems. And you'll see as I go through some of the innovative techniques that we're looking at, if we can reduce the amount of iron and aluminum and total acidity going into our biochemical reactors, these will be more efficient and smaller. And you don't have the plugging problems that you do if you start accumulating all this iron in these systems. The biochemical reactors will treat it, but you have to make them bigger to handle this kind of a load. All right. So let's look at that. Uh, and the first two of these, the iron terrace and the acid neutralizing cells, are particularly designed to get rid of some of that initial iron and acid load. Uh, the last two manganese removal beds and peat sorption media work best with uh, circumneutral drainage 
and often can be considered polishing or depending on the water quality could actually be a standalone treatment. Okay, so if you've looked at the agenda, you know that there are two other papers following me. One, my co-author Jim Gusek is giving, and that's a detailed investigation of iron terrace. And then Eric Krapani is also giving something related to the construction of the iron terraces. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this because they're gonna cover it in much more detail. So I'm just gonna kind of highlight a few things about it. One is that iron terraces are something we see. And again, as I mentioned before, this is how we make our advances in passive treatment. We actually observe and say, well, what's causing this? This is pretty cool. And these are all iron terraces seen at mine sites. But if you look, this is essentially like a ferrocrete deposit. And these are something that occur, you know, historically over time and are a very natural phenomena. So again, Jim will talk and Eric will talk, Eric will talk about how we build these things and, and Jim will talk about how these things, how we can utilize these for passive treatment to reduce the iron loads. Again, this is there, we don't quite understand everything about these terraces and how to actually engineer them yet, but we're working on it. Uh, it is a biologically mediated process. Um, there's a lot of variables that go in. These are just a few of them. But we do see this kind of system working over a fairly large pH range of anywhere from two to six. We do see some trace metal removal. Uh, it's a function of the metal and the pHs. And again, we're forming a terrace. So this is a continual deposition over time. And so long-term treatment is possible here. And this is some numbers I got from Jim of he's seen some iron removal about the order of five grams per square meter per day basically the same range as we're seeing in the wetlands, maybe not quite as much, but again, it's still a developing technology. Okay, I'm gonna leave that and then go to another technology that's also aimed at reducing that high initial iron, aluminum, and acid load, and that's called acid neutralizing cells, aptly titled. So, as I mentioned before, um, People often thought that they could use limestone to treat acid drainage, but found out that unfortunately it rapidly plugged. So this was a new approach. Uh, it's also sometimes referred to as dispersed alkaline substrate or DAS. And the concept was developed by B.T. Thomas and Tobias Rotting, and they published something in 2007. And the idea is, okay, if we use fine limestone, that will react quickly. And it's probably not gonna plug and if we can disperse that into a matrix that has good permeability like wood chips, I think we can get flow through this and treatment. And so that's, that's the objective, that we want to remove the iron and aluminum. And what we're seeing is that we co-precipitate certain trace metals, particularly arsenic and copper. So the advantages of this is a very short residence time, about six to 12 hours. And there's some data that suggest even maybe shorter on the order of maybe three hours. It's important that we maintain the aerobic conditions here, because again, we're trying, we're, 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 we're focusing on aerobic reactions. And you know, as soon as the limestone is totally dissolved, and then the system is done. And, and so what we've been looking at more is kind of a short-term system, something build it so it's easy to replace. And again, it protects, it can often protect the BCR that follows this in, in terms of our treatment train approach. So this is a case study that was done um, by, by a master's student, Kristen Dieterman out of Winona State University. Uh, this was an underground mine. It was deep in the mine. And you can see this is the water and you can actually see that there are iron terraces forming in this, but not enough to get rid of all the iron. So it's kind of classic acid rock drainage, pH of 2.5, pretty high uh, iron. And it had a series of trace metals that we're interested in trying to remove. So we wanted to put the system in the mine. So again, it had to be inexpensive, it'd be easy to maintain. And because of the ventilation in the mine system, it, there could be no, no gases produced. So we had to, they did not want any kind of anaerobic conditions and the potential of any you know, H2S. And so the acid neutralizing cells seemed like a very good approach. So this is come some of Christian, this is Christian's uh, picture of her column. Uh, you can see that it's working very well for getting out iron. Um, and so we wanted to precipitate the iron and hopefully co-precipitate the copper. And this is just a kind of a summary of her results again, and it worked very well. You know, a nice bump in pH, certainly into discharge range, uh, you know, 
very good removal of iron, and you know, roughly about a 60% removal in copper. So overall, kind of a very effective mechanism for treating that particular type of water. All right, let's talk about manganese removal beds. So these are really, um, they were developed to kind of polish manganese from coal mine drainage. You know, it was easy to get the iron and the acidity out with the various passive systems, but manganese does not come out readily in biochemical reactors. Or, um, and so they wanted something different. And so this is a limestone treatment bed and it's a horizontal flow system. You have to get rid of the iron first before you can oxidize the, the magnesium, uh, the manganese, sorry. And Nori Robbins, who is a microbiologist who worked for USGS, identified 12 different mechanisms that are all biologically mediated to oxidize the, the manganese. I mean, if you look at the thermodynamics, manganese should not, manganese should oxidize readily, but it's not just thermodynamics, it's all the kinetics. And so the only way you can get manganese to come out of solution is essentially through the biological processes that accelerate the oxidation and removal. And as a result, these are best suited for circumneutral pH, and that's really what they were, were developed for. So again, this is kind of, a, kind of just a classic show. It's a horizontal bed, and you can see this black is essentially the manganese minerals accumulating within the limestone matrix. So the ability of manganese to absorb metals is something that's been documented in the literature. And we kind of know that this happens because we know that these deep, the deep sea nodules are full of trace metals. And you've probably heard that people periodically discuss, well, maybe we could mine these in the future as an additional source of metals. So back in 2008, uh, GM Gusick put together this passive table, the periodic table of passive treatment. And essentially the blue and the orange elements are treatable in various types of passive treatment systems. Well, in, in 2013, he updated it when we started to look at this whole idea of manganese absorption of trace metals. And all of these lines basically connect these different elements to manganese. And so there seems to be a lot of potential to utilize this for trace metal treatment. So, and this is some data I got from my friends who are dealing with coal mine drainage out east. Uh, this is from Brent Means of the Office of Surface Mining. You know, again, the being kind of science nerds, we all like to look at, well, what, what, what do you think is happening with some of these other things? You, you don't hear a lot about trace metals and coal mine drainage, but th there is, they, they do exist. This is obviously a log scale. You can see we're down, you know, well, you know, this is the manganese coming in at over, you know, 10,000 micrograms per liter, and we've got 100 micrograms per liter of nickel and cobalt. But you can see we got a 43% removal, and this is basically samples taken as the water moves through the bed from left to right, but over about an 80 to 85% removal of the trace metals. So that's, that's, uh, that's pretty decent removal. So this is some other data from my other friend, Tim Danahe with Biomos on a pilot study that he did, again, the main focus was, you know, manganese treatment. Uh, he was also looking at some iron treatment here as well, but he luckily had some interest and some funding to look at some of the trace metals. And you can see, you know, anywhere from 50 to 70% removal of copper, nickel, and zinc in these systems. So I said, well, these are kind of really cool data. And, and so I just said, well, let's, let's do some calculations because I'm kind of curious. And so these are the numbers. Again, the manganese being in higher concentration, we're in grams per square meter per day, uh, anywhere from about three to seven. And the trace metals are again back in the milligrams per meter square per day, just like the wetlands. And we're running anywhere from like 50 to 90, which is pretty darn good. Because if you remember, and since it's early, maybe you weren't, I haven't put you to sleep yet, but the nickel removal in the wetlands was only about 40 milligrams per square meter per day. So this is giving as good or better removal than wetlands and you know a lot easier to build and maintain if you have the right kind of water. All right, so luckily, uh, again, Tim did some, um, again, he's a real science and data nerd just like me. And so he actually said, well, I wonder what's in the solids. Let's analyze the solids. And so this is what he got. Again, not surprising, a lot of manganese in this water. But what's really interesting is the amount of trace metals. So this essentially is 0.6% um, cobalt and 0.3% nickel. Those are basically ore grade. 
So if we could get enough of this stuff, uh, so we want all of you to go out and start treating water so we can start generating enough so we can start recovering trace metals so we can fuel our green economy. But it is pretty interesting. Uh, this manganese does accumulate in the pores and does have to remove periodically, but it's relatively easy. Again, uh, Tim's group has been able to do that and restore operation uh, within a day. All right, let's talk about peat sorption meeting, which is our last one. So in 2018 at the conference, I kind of gave a full presentation on, on this material. So I'm not going to repeat that data. I've got some new data to show you. But again, if you want some more data, this is not enough and you need more, it's there. So peat, you know, again, this is one of the things that, that I looked at early on in my career when I was looking at well and treatment. Peat has an amazing natural affinity to take out trace metals, but it has terrible flow properties. But by forming it into a granule and hardening it, we, can, we keep the property to remove metals, but now we have something that passes water like coarse sand. So it is a perfect engineered media for any kind of passive application because it has very high permeability, very high metal affinity. And this stuff, if you, if you look at it, it's, it's you know, 0.6 to 2 millimeters. It kind of looks like coffee grounds, basically. Um, Doug says he's actually drunk coffee made from it. Uh, he's not going to get me to do that. It, it works best with circumneutral pH. Uh, it originally was designed to target dissolved trace metals. And again, in the literature, you know, there are five different mechanisms at work in, the, in P to remove metals. What we have been finding is that it removes very fine particulate metals. We estimate this in the three to five micron zone from some of our data. And this, this is much finer than you'd expect based on physical filtration, based on the size of the media alone. So smaller particles are taken out than you'd expect just some physical filtration. It has a very short contact time, five to 10 minutes. For dissolved trace metals, there are a finite number of removal sites, so it is a finite lifetime. For suspended metals, we can backwash this thing and continue to use it. We have some pilot data where we've run it for over a year with no loss in the ability to remove these fine particulates. So this is some data uh, from, um, this is, a, this is some coal mine drainage. So they were basically treating it both in an active system and they had water coming out of a clarifier and a passive system coming out of a pond. And they were having residual aluminum. And based on the pH, it seemed like this is circumneutral water. This has all got to be particulate. And that's true. Now, unfortunately, this was one of those times when you know, they had all this high aluminum. And then, of course, when you need the sample, it stops raining and they can't get you a decent sample. So, you know, only the pond clarifier was a little bit above the standard. The, the clarifier was the pond water was not, but we still see, you know, 70 to 80% removal. So 90% of the aluminum was particulate. And this is kind of the, the particle size ranges that we saw, you know, this, most of the pond material was much smaller than the clarifier material. But again, very fine particulates being removed very effectively. And this is just kind of a comparison between other kinds of media filters. You know, sand filter typically takes out 10 to 20 microns, multimedia 5 to 10. Neither of those take out dissolved metals. The peat sorption media, again, we're estimating 3 to 5 uh, with a media size similar to coarse sand. And it also has the added benefit of taking out dissolved metals. Okay, so the last slide here is just a dissolve. I want to talk about some dissolved metal treatment. Uh, this is a study from a mineral processing site. There was some runoff water that we wanted to look at to see whether the peat media could effectively treat this. This is, this is screaming water. This is about seven milligrams per. Units. Uh, and this is a senior research project that um, Alex Vaslow is doing at Winona State University. And so this is the total number of water treated uh, in bed volumes. And so a, a bed volume, you can think of bed volume, if you had a gallon of water, basically one bed volume is one gallon. So essentially that's how much, so essentially if you had one gallon, we could pass, you know, 1300 gallons through. So in this little column, basically you pass the 50 gallons of water through this little tiny column and are still getting 50% removal of zinc, 
80% removal of cadmium and over a 99% removal of lead. So again, as I mentioned, PET has these different removal mechanisms. And as you can see, even though we're starting to load this material with zinc, we still have more than enough capacity to, to remove lead for a very long time and cadmium for a long time, but not obviously as long as lead. So again, the different removal mechanisms make this very versatile and against the important of doing site characterization and feasibility testing. So uh, what happened here is unfortunately, um, there was a, an infamous laboratory, <laughs> laboratory issue. We ran out of water and pumped a whole bunch of air into the column. So we had to restart the column. That was right before COVID. And so Alex has not been able to get back into the lab, but we've just heard that, um, you know, state universities are back in the lab. So hopefully we can get this experiment up and running. When I made some calculations, just looking at the average estimated amount of removal, um, I basically calculated uh, an average concentration on the zinc of already 1.4%, and we only have half the capacity uh, taken up, or about half the capacity, we think. So uh, again, it's, it's, just, it's kind of some fun data, and it's been a fun experiment, and it's been great working with the students at, at the university. So again, this is just kind of a summary table of kind of the advantages and disadvantages of these that kind of uh, I've mentioned again, I, I don't need to read it to you. It's, it'll be, you know, as part of the presentation. But, you know, in summary, these first two, the iron terrace and acid neutralizing cells are primarily working with low pH water, uh, targeting primarily, you know, iron aluminum acidity. And the manganese treatment bed and peat sorption media really work best with circumneutral media, circumneutral water targeting trace metal removal. So I think with that, I'm going to try to summarize and leave some time for questions. I think why, why I enjoy this and why I continue to do it is that we're always learning new things, that it continues to evolve. We're learning new things. Um, those of us in the passive treatment world um, are a bunch of engineering, science, and data nerds, and we love it. And so <laughs> we continue to do it. Um, way past when my daughters think maybe I should get a real life. But anyway, uh, again, it's important that you, you look at each of these, you look at the tools in your toolbox and you pick the right tool. And it's gonna be a function of the water chemistry, your flows and your treatment goals. And these new approaches are exciting because sometimes they can be standalone, uh, but they always can be incorporated with other existing methods to improve kind of our passive treatment technologies and our compliance uh, percentages. And with that, uh, if you're confused, just ask a question. Thanks. So Susie, I'll turn it back to you. Okay, here's a, a question for you. Um, let's see, great presentation, some very interesting information. Uh, there's a couple of questions. Do the iron terraces require aeration to be most effective, or does the terracing flow effect provide sufficient oxidation for Fe precip? So I'm going to I'm going to leave that question for Jim, but it is an it is essentially an aerobic process, and I think he can probably provide better detail than I can on that. Okay, and then the second part, has the peat product been evaluated for AS or SB removal? So, um, the, the peat as is, is essentially a cation um, remover. But we are doing some, we've got some really, uh, again, this is why I continue to do this, because it continues to evolve. We are actually looking at modifying the peat media uh, through some iron chemistry and, and also adding functional groups. Because one of our other targets, a big sulfate is a very big issue in uh, where I come from, Minnesota, because we probably have the <coughs> lowest sulfate standard in the, in the country of 10 milligrams per liter, which is set to protect wild rice, which is a very important food crop for our indigenous populations. And so sulfate's a big issue. We've been adding functional groups to that and that those we've got some prototypes, they do show activity towards selenate. The iron chemistry is showing good activity against arsenate and phosphate. So I think, you know, 
hopefully maybe maybe next year or in the following year, I can actually have some data to to show on how we can actually use this media to to go after some of the an problematic anions as well. Okay, another question. Nice presentation, Paul. Does the limestone sand experience passivation as a result of iron oxide precipitation? I'm not sure what I... So again, because of the, the distribution, okay. it's roughly 75% wood chips, about 25% kind of like lime sand. And so again, what we see is that we're not getting plugging and we're not getting passivation. So it continues to treat uh, and we're basically looking at kind of more of a limestone. And Kristen ran her experiments for about a year and we never saw any loss of treatment. Um, you know, again, it's still, you know, I know I've got um, one of my friends, B.T. Thomas, who was kind of instrumental in the development of stuff, has been trying to get some of these things. He's got some pilot tests, but I don't think we have any really, you know, full scale long-term data to actually answer that question. But based on the pilot stuff, it's very promising. We don't expect passivation we just expect to run out of limestone. Can, can I chime in here? Is it possible? Sure. Go ahead. This, you this want to answer, the iron, answer, the, answer it, the iron oxidation question too. It is oxidation. Well, <laughs> well first of all, the, uh, the lime, we, we ended up like in 1994, we were running a biochemical reactor and overloading it. And it was, aer it was aerobic, it had uh, positive ORPs. And we were theorizing that the limestone was behaving as an ion exchange media and we were making the mineral siderite, which is iron carbonate. So we were bumping off the calcium iron and substituting iron uh, for the calcium. And this was, uh, this is something I think maybe the, the researchers need to look at because we are just theorizing it. We're doing a calcium balance and magnesium balances and trying to sort out, you know, what, what's going on. We're removing iron, but it wasn't coming out is the oxidized form. So that's there. Um, and for the, uh, for the iron terrace, I'll, I'll just, we'll leave that question to the, to the end. Mm -hmm. Next presentation. presentation. Yeah. Okay. 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 So then uh, an additional question is, can the passive approach work with high arsenic and higher flows, a hundred plus gallons per minute in a small land area? Oh, well, I mean, the thing you give up um, with passive technology, passive, most of the technologies require larger footprints. Um, the, the, bio, the, bug, the better living with alcohol, we, we can reduce the footprint. Um, and so that is certainly uh, a possibility. Um, I think depending on the water chemistry, we do see arsenic renewal in some of those systems. And so I think it might be a possibility. You know, the bugs on booze, as we call it, is... It's more a semi-passive because you, you have to add, it's a continual input of organic material. Uh, you know, it's a kind of a liquid feed. Uh, there has been some experiments back in the days of the, the Bureau of Mines where they're actually looking at polylactate beads, which are kind of a slow dissolving uh, source of organic media. Um, Again, that would be a great project to, to go back and look at again and, and try to reinstitute, but it's, it's still kind of one of those things, things to be tested and things we really need some more students for. So, so again, I think it's possible, but it's probably, you know, in small footprints, you're probably really looking more for semi-pass or sometimes we call them hybrid systems. Uh, we may have to combine a couple of steps to get it out in, if you don't have much space because that is one of the limitations of the passive systems. They need, they need, they need landscape. Well, I'll chime in again in the- sure. just, You are co-author, so feel I'm, free. I'm, 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 gonna have, I'm gonna have a, a, a couple of slides on the Empire Mine passive treatment system out in California. And uh, it, it was functioning, it is functioning. It's been operating for about 10 years at 1200 gallons per minute, I don't know, about 24 seven. There are some minor variations, but the arsenic uh, influent is uh, 0.13 milligrams per liter. That's 130 parts per billion. Uh, and I believe they're meeting the effluent standard of 10 micrograms uh, pretty consistently. So that answers that uh, speaker or that, that question. Yeah, and I've, how big that, that's not, that's not a huge area, right? Um, no, I'd, I'd say the total, the total area for arsenic removal is probably a couple, less than a couple of acres. 
you've got a settling pond and an aerobic wetland. Right. And again, the arsenic in that system is coming out with a co-precipitation. Yes, it's, it's adsorbing onto the iron. Right. So again, again, it depending, again, if you had, I mean, and we see arsenic removal, you know, in some of the iron terrace data, we also see it in the acid neutralizing cells because, you know, iron, co-precipitation with iron is, is a very strong passive uh, mechanism for removing arsenic. And, and you're right, Jim, it doesn't take that much area. So I guess it all depends on, you know, how much area the, 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 uh, the questioner has to work with. But it certainly is worth looking at. You can do your own estimate. Five grams per day per square meter is a good, good starting point for That's iron. Right. Iron, right, yeah. And, and for arsenic, for every five moles of, our, uh, for every one mole of arsenic, you should try to match it with five moles of, of iron removal. Those are just you know, rule of thumb. Okay, any other questions? We haven't had any come through for a while, so. We've, we've, over, we've overspent our, our time limit. <laughs> that is yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. we'll be fine. That's not, a, that's not yeah. an issue, do not worry yeah. about that. Yeah. And we haven't dazzled them with brilliance, so we baffle them with you know what. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much, Paul and Jim. So thank you, and it's a nice segue uh, from Paul to Jim. So um, I will now introduce you to our next speaker, which is Jim Gusick, and he has also been joining Paul and answering some of these, these questions. Um, so Jim, uh, has graduated from the Colorado School of Mines uh, with a Bachelor of Science in Mining Engineering. He specializes in the design of passive treatment systems for mining influenced water. Since 1987, his work with acid rock drainage prevention and passive water treatment systems has included about 100 projects throughout the U.S. and internationally. He is on the steering and mitigation committees of the Acid Drainage Technology Initiative Metal Mining Sector. He is a founding member and former president of the Denver Professional Chapter of Engineers Without Borders, and he joined Lincoln Engineering in February of 2019. So welcome, Jim. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, as, as, as a former president of the uh, Denver chapter of Engineers Without Borders. Uh, I'll, I'll have to do my John F. Kennedy imitation. The, uh, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for a foreign country. So with that, we'll uh, start off with, uh, thanks for inviting us. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge my co-author and co-worker and idea collaborator, uh, Lee Joslin. Let's see if I can advance this. And uh, so there, I've got five parts of my presentation. Uh, first is kind of a passive treatment background. Uh, basically, Paul went over this uh, in quite a lot of uh, detail. I'm just gonna summarize it a little bit here, do some examples on how Mother Nature do it, does it, uh, maybe talk a little chemistry, and then talk about five project uh, examples and you know a potential path forward. So, uh, there's a subliminal message in this slide, um, colorblind, I think our marketing folks tell me it's, uh, it's there, but uh, anyway, passive treatment of mining influence water involves, it's a sequential ecological extraction of metals. They're man-made systems, but we try to make it look as natural as possible. It's sequential because, as Paul pointed out, there's, there's just no one step is going to do it all. There's no magic bullet. You kind of have to put your toolbox together uh, in a way to, to, to make things work. Secondly, it's an ecological uh, process in that there's usually something living associated with, with all these processes, uh, you know, either plants or microbes, uh, something is, is, uh, is participating. And lastly, it's an extraction process. You can basically take dissolved metals and turn them into suspended solids or solid materials, precipitates, but really you do need to worry about the filtration, the extraction process. Otherwise, you're just, uh, you're discharging total uh, suspended solids. So 
Uh, basically, these are the mechanisms that we look at for passive treatment, and the, the red highlighted one here is going to be the focus of my talk. Uh, basically, we're precipitating uh, hydroxide and oxides uh, with uh, thiobacillus, ferroxidins, bacteria, and other critters. Uh, and basically, what we're going to be talking about is doing this with no lime, no pH adjustment required. I know this sounds like snake oil, but really, it, uh, it does work. Um, and, uh, and so we're going to talk about uh, how Mother Nature does it. So why do terraces form? You know, in the formation of travertine terraces pro provides a nice analog. This is, uh, I think, a photo of uh, the iron, uh, the uh, travertine terraces at the Mammoth Hot Springs. So the initial terrace formation, we think, might be due to the standing wave phenomenon that, uh, that we see, you know, here where the fluid velocity of a leading edge, you know, coursing over a flat surface, there's a, a lot of turbulence, a lot of air exchange, oxygen exchange, you know, right at the leading edge of that, uh, uh, the leading edge of that wave. And so that, uh, you know, what we're seeing is that uh, the fluid velocity where it's greatest, the, the, the flow velocity and calcium carbonate precipitation here govern the rate of travertine deposition. But we think that the flow velocity is also an iron uh, uh, deposition controlling factor in iron terraces. So I've got a couple of papers here. You can download these uh, from the presentation at, at the close. I'm going to be talking about this second one, uh, uh, Espana et, et al., a little bit more in a couple of slides. So uh, they got some really good work there. So my first encounter with a quasi-iron terrace was in 1988 when I entered the Argo Tunnel in Idaho Springs, Colorado as part of a Superfund investigation. And I was able to walk on top of a two-foot layer of iron oxyhydroxide for about 300 feet before it started to give way under my feet. And we eventually cleaned it all out with some old, along with some old mine cars with a track loader. And I thought the accumulated iron was interesting, you know, but I didn't really give it that much thought. Fast forward 17 years and I heard a paper by Tiff Hilton at a mine drainage conference in West Virginia. If you've ever met him, uh, Tiff Hilton is quite a character. But he remarked that he had seen iron removal in a ditch, which is not exactly the same as a terrace, but he had no specific, uh, uh, you know, scientific explanation for what he saw. He's seeing, you know, just with no pH adjustment, major, minor bump, he's seeing, you know, acidity reductions, iron reductions, you know, 60%, 50% reduction, he's saying, what's going on here? And so he thought bugs were involved. He called it bug central. And, uh, but and, and at the same time, roughly about the same time, Bill Burgos, Professor Bill Burgos at Penn State was looking at this, and but he was actually measuring reaction kinetics. He was coming up with, remember Paul mentioned the five grams per day per, per square meter of wetted surface. Bill Burgos was responsible for coming up with that number. So out west, we saw some geologists from the USGS were poking around the Anna space and near Silverton discovering through carbon dating that some of the ferrocrete formations started to be deposited at the close of the last ice age. But they weren't looking uh, at this situation from an engineer's perspective. You know, so we really, you know, oh, isn't this nice? They're also measuring manganocrete. So they're measuring uh, or observing manganocrete uh, deposition too. So this is related to um, the manganese removal beds that, that Paul talked about. This is a really good paper. You should, everybody who's interested in this should download it. Uh, it uh, discusses uh, some chemistry across the, across the Atlantic at the, in the Iberian pyrite belt in Spain, where they took, were taking samples running down the Rio Tinto River. Uh, and, uh, and basically what they were finding was just incredible. Uh, the, uh, does any, of the, you know, does any of this look familiar to you? You know, it's mother nature at work, removing iron without chemicals at a low pH. So you gotta ask the question, how can this happen? What's going on? So 
This site in Idaho was my first up close and personal look at the terracing phenomenon. And again, I had Tiff Hilton's and Bill Burgos's observations kind of in the back of my head. I saw three things happening at this site. So it's an underground uh, adit discharging uh, into a couple of ponds. And it was discharging uh, through some interesting uh, culvert, half culvert materials. And so fortunately, I love this quote, chance favors only the prepared mind. So with Bill and, and Tiff's ideas in the back of my head, I saw three things. I saw this bioterracing. I saw some cyanobacteria, some algae floating on the top of uh, some standing water. I'm seeing some biofilms. Obviously, I'm seeing some iron deposition. So I said, hmm, this is interesting. Maybe this is going to be uh, the solution to pollution at this site. And so uh, I started to look at, at what else is, uh, is could be happening. What are the common denominators? And what I was seeing, at some, and I started looking at some other sites, so I'm seeing ferrous iron, the forest litter, and algae seem to be the common denominators. Here's the Argo Tunnel where I was able to walk in uh, for 300 feet. And I'm also seeing, you know, terracing within pipes. This is the Elizabeth Mine in, in, uh, in Vermont and some other, you know, these are the common denominators. So is there anything else going on? And, and so the, uh, the other factors, you know, that seem to be important is instantaneous flow velocity. We'll get to that here in a minute. So what happens? Here's a different, this is a repeat of, of uh, one of Paul's slides, is that, uh, you know, we've got sulfate reduction, but what we're really focusing on is this reaction right here. Ferrous, uh, ferric iron hydrolyzing to iron oxyhydroxide, but it also produces more hydrogen ions. So what's happening here? The pH is, has a tendency to drop when this reaction goes to completion. So what are some possible iron terrace reactions that no one has ever thought about, at, this, at least to this point? And one of them, which is intriguing, is cellulose dehydration by acidity. If you have cellulose and, and you expose it to acid, you're gonna create uh, basically elemental carbon, some more water and some heat. And you can also see uh, within an iron terrace that uh, if you have ferrous iron present, it's gonna uh, utilize a hydrogen ion and you know, produce ferric iron. And then you also have iron hydrolysis. All of these processes are in competition. So two of the reactions actually consume hydrogen ions, so the pH should go up, even on like a microscopic basis. And so all these hydrogen ions that are being uh, generated by, you know, iron hydrolysis are actually being consumed by these other reactions. So now what's up with this, you know, cellulose dehydration? You know, so we're also seeing, you know, iron, ferric iron be re recycled here. So Let's take a closer look. You know, do you, do you all remember high school chemistry when you added sulfuric acid to sugar? You can, you can, I don't know if you want to try this at home. You get this steaming carbon snake coming up out of the beaker. The, the, what's happening is that the acidity uh, in the, uh, the ARD is doing the same thing. And uh, so basically here's some leaf litter that I pulled up out of a, a mine site in Kentucky. And obviously this, uh, it was just green perhaps several, you know, weeks ago before it fell in, but you can see that elemental carbon uh, being formed as the uh, chlorophyll, as the, uh, the cellulose in this leaf is being decomposed basically into elemental carbon. So the other thing that's going on is we know that photosynthesis consumes, you know, consumes carbon dioxide and produces oxygen under a terrestrial environment. But in an aquatic environment, what we have now is we've got basically carbonic acid is being consumed to produce glucose and, uh, oops, let me back up, and hydroxide ion. So this is, has a tendency to raise the pH. Close up. Also, the algae in this portal biofilm. This is from the uh, from the, the site in Idaho. These basically these Euglena uh, photosynthetic protozoa. They basically photosynthesize during the day and during the night. They prey on the algae. So 
this is another form of, of how the pH, uh, you know, how this can, these things can happen uh, in, in, a, in an aquatic environment. So I'm going to talk about five example projects. Uh, Idaho, Arizona, Vermont, Colorado, and maybe, just maybe, a redo for a California site, and we were talking about that uh, at the end of Paul's talk. Again, this is going back to the, uh, the iron terrace uh, and aluminum terrace formation at the uh, Moran Tunnel. And so uh, what I'm seeing here is, uh, again, some views of the site. I'm seeing some dead moths and some organic matter, cyanobacteria. This is obviously working under low temperatures. Look at the, look though, at the concentrations of the mining influence water here, aluminum at the 800 milligrams per liter, iron at 1.7 grams per liter. This stuff is just hotter than a pistol. Incredible. So um, what we did is we set up some uh, test troughs. So, um, and due to the onset of winter, we could only run these for 56 days, about two months. A big problem though, was the high iron, con the high concentrations. So the experimental or analytical uncertainty wouldn't detect the major chemistry uh, changes from the trough influent to the trough effluent. So in, in, in what we're doing is we're testing oxygenated, uh, anoxic soils with manure, non-plastic inert plastic media, non-organic inert plastic media, and kind of a chopped salad uh, with jute mat uh, in the various troughs, and we're hoping that we could observe this, you know, validate this five grams per day per square meter number that Bill Burgos was, uh, was observing. And so in order to do this, we basically had to harvest and weigh all of the precipitates in the troughs. So basically we, we did a major autopsy. And what we found is, again, we're running for 56 days and these are the milligrams per kilogram of iron and sulfate and aluminum. And we use those to calculate our grams uh, removed per square meter per day. And iron was not bad, you know, 8.1, uh, you know, grams per day per square meter. Aluminum, not so, not so good. But here's the interesting thing. The non-organic inert plastic media, which is basically just a filter, uh, you know, a plastic filter did the best. So this was very surprising to us. So we took that information, we designed a full-scale uh, passive treatment system, uh, re retrofitted a couple of terraces, and I hate to say this, but uh, the, the folks we were working with uh, redesigned it without our, uh, without our knowledge and put in these uh, berms of uh, zeolite, ponded up the material, ponded up the water behind them, and it didn't work really as well as we had hoped. And uh, we went back to do an additional retrofit. And, uh, and, and it still this did, did not work out as, as well we, as, as hoped. But this is not the iron terrace that we had envisioned. So our second site is a uh, pilot system at the January Attic in Arizona. And here, the water, temp the water chemistry is, is not that bad. And this was the, the test was kind of a first step in our treatment train that included a biochemical reactor, aerobic wetland, and a manganese removal bed. And again, like I said, the chemistry isn't bad. You know, neutral pH or sucrum neutral pH it had some alkalinity, not that much iron. We ran it for, you know, basically 24 weeks. And uh, at the end of, of week 15, we modified it and then we increased the flow in week 18. So Let's look at what happened here. Uh, what we did in the stage one is we put in these permeable barriers uh, to encourage the terraces and we seeded it because we thought it was important with organic matter. And we also seeded it with ferric oxyhydroxide that uh, we'd harvested from a nearby swamp and very disappointing results. Only 0.4 grams of iron removal per day per square meter. And we're saying, okay, what's going on here? And what we found from the ORP values of the effluent of this, uh, this terrace, uh, this iron terrace, was that we really weren't getting oxidizing conditions. This kind of speaks to one of the earlier questions at the end of Paul's talk. And ORP was very important. So 
what we're seeing is that the organic matter, which we thought we needed, we probably had too much. And we are seeing, uh, you know, anoxic conditions occurring within the wood chips, preventing the iron from oxidizing uh, and being precipitated. We're making ferrous iron. Uh, and so we're, we, we're not removing it. So what we did in stage two, we replaced the, the wattles with basically with bricks. We, had, we took out the organic matter and re replaced it with inert gravel, and then we reseeded it with the iron oxyhydroxide. And we got some improvement. It basically doubled our, uh, you know, our removal rate from 0 0.4 to 0 0.8 grams per day per square meter, but this was still not close to what we were expecting. You know, Bill Burgos's number was about five. So we said, what the heck, let's just increase the flow. We quadrupled the flow to almost a liter a minute, and we saw better iron removal. I mean, what's going on here? So we went, went and looked at the site, and we're actually seeing little eddy currents, mini whirlpools. So as an iron particle, we theorized, as an iron particle was forming, it would start to see an uh, additional contact uh, with the uh, uh, with, with other iron particles, and this kind of would mimic what's going on, say, in a high-density sludge uh, active treatment plant where you're recycling some of your uh, initial precipitates to get things uh, to happen. And also we're seeing some biofilms. So very interesting information there. So our, our next site is, is actually a, uh, it's the Elizabeth Mine Superfund site in Vermont. And when I arrived at the site, uh, I basically observed, you know, a, another, uh, like a volunteer iron terrace forming at the base of a, a tailings facility. And so I was seeing different colors and I'm suspecting different, uh, uh, different minerals are forming here, Schwartmanite and uh, maybe Gertite. And uh, you can see the mini terracing that's going on here. So even when I, you know, I went downstream off site, and I found evidence that Mother Nature's been doing this, you know, and, and fer ferrocrete deposits in Copper's Brook, which is uh, which was just outside of their uh, of the mine site area. So we started to uh, say taking this information and uh, look a little bit closer and saw the same thing. We're seeing more iron deposition in high velocity flow areas. We see some leaf litter. We see some biofilms. All this is uh, suggesting that you know these are very important mechanisms uh, for iron removal at this site. And so, while I was there, I I did a uh, an informal sampling event in 2016, and I sampled starting at the seep sources. Uh, I and I was able to collect enough data to calculate some grams per day per square meter numbers. And it was interesting to see 5.7 grams per day per square meter, like immediately uh, after the seepage formed, a little bit further downstream, I saw it was dropping to 2.2. So we, we looked back at, at the literature and found that this is consistent with the first order kinetics of iron removal. So the stronger the iron concentration, the better the removal you're gonna get. So it's kind of the law of diminishing returns. So we took this information and designed a demonstration pilot. And this was uh, six weeks after commissioning. Uh, we found that uh, unfortunately we were, we were kind of short on water, so we had to actually pump some uh, from uh, commingled toe, toe seepage. And we're seeing, this is again, is a, you know, a month and a half after startup and we're already seeing uh, short manite being uh, deposited. We're seeing suspected uh, girthite, which is slightly aged. So this is all, uh, you know, evidence that, that this process is, uh, is viable. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we lost our, our, uh, our contact, our contract with our EPA uh, prime contractor. So data on this uh, was, was lacking. And, you know, we, we don't have very much data to, to report. So now we're gonna look at a fourth site. This is a, 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 called the Elk Tunnel. It's near Silverton, Colorado. The flows uh, are pretty high here, 80 gallons per minute. Uh, circum, you know, slightly acidic mine water, but it does have some alkalinity. Again, not the worst chemistry in the world. Uh, four grams of, uh, four milligrams per liter of iron, two milligrams of, of manganese, but the real key here 
this is uh, discharging in the cement creek is uh, the, the zinc is uh, 0.2 milligrams per liter. And what was happening here is that the, uh, the, the BLM who managed this site, they built this passive treatment system. They ran it through a long channel, they ran it through an upper pond, uh, dropped out some iron, they ran it through a middle pond, dropped out some more iron, and a final lower pond, and hopefully uh, get most of the iron and the zinc out uh, before it discharged into Cement Creek. And so this was high maintenance. They were coming in very frequently and having to muck out these ponds. So we were approached to say, be part of a team to, uh, to do, you know, basically retrofit this and turn it into an iron terrace. And so without any data, this is a very fast track uh, uh, project. We, we had four months from design to construction to, uh, to put it all together. And so we sent out the uh, BLM folks to take some samples, starting at the collapse portal down to, uh, down to the end. And we, oops. And we found, again, really high grams per day per square meter removal rates. Highest at the portal, decreasing the further you got down, uh, down, the, down the line. But also what was interesting, we're seeing very poor removal in these ponds you know, less than three, gram, three uh, grams per day per square meter, but really high removal rates in, in the, uh, the channel portions. So uh, fast forward uh, in September, almost a year ago, uh, next month, we built an iron terrace. Uh, basically, they relined the channel uh, coming from the portal, and we installed, uh, basically filled that uh, line channel with inert rock, and we had two, uh, uh, two iron terraces, an upper iron terrace, lower terrace, and we distributed the water through, uh, through like a, a water distribution trough. Uh, and the final, uh, we had a settling pond at the end and then a channel uh, that was filled with limestone, do a final pH adjustment and maybe get some zinc precipitation uh, through manganese deposition in this final channel. Uh, and this is what the site looks like uh, right after construction. It was working really well. You can actually see a, uh, a four-minute video on YouTube if you follow that link uh, and, uh, and see a close-up view of this. So you have an upper terrace, lower terrace, settling pond. Uh, again, this was a uh, very fast track and unfortunately due to some uh, data validation issues with the Bureau of Land Management, it's been a year since this thing was constructed and I still don't have any performance data on it. If anybody lives close to, the, to Silverton and be willing to go up and sample this for us, we'll send you the, uh, we'll send you the sampling uh, kit and uh, we'd love to get these and we'd have, them have, have the site analyzed. Last site, this is a, uh, we talked about this earlier, this is a 1200 gallon per minute system at the Empire Mine State Park. It's been running for 10 years uh, and in compliance with for iron, arsenic, and manganese removal. And I'm looking at this as a potential iron terrace redo candidate. If I had the opportunity to do this over, I would have uh, done away with the, uh, the aerobic wetlands and substituted uh, an iron terrace. And why, why am I suggesting that? Well, before we do, uh, let's look at the chemistry. Again, not the worst chemistry in the world. We've got uh, neutral pH, arsenic uh, at uh, 130 parts per billion, but with a really low standard, uh, iron at 24 milligrams per liter, manganese about 3.5, 3.2. But look at this manganese standard, 50 parts per billion. Uh, again, we've been in, uh, in compliance for about 10 years, even hitting these low standards. So, the evidence that we had where this might actually work was this iron oxide, oxyhydroxide filled channel just downstream from the discharge point. Uh, so we're think, I'm, I'm thinking in retro, retrospect that this was a big clue that an iron terrace would have worked great here. So when we started to look at the, uh, the evolution of conditions at the site, as we, we had these plantings in the first aerobic wetland four years later it was just chock full of willows and we had planted these willows to basically oxygenate the water as much as we could because uh, willows are very efficient at that but this became a, a, a big maintenance headache and uh, so what you know if we went with an iron terrace 
anaerobic wetland, this might be a little bit better approach. But here's some other clues. We actually saw this, that we had a settling pond as part of the process uh, flow diagram. And uh, we were seeing at just two years after uh, commissioning, we're seeing iron terracing forming or iron deposition in this outfall channel. So if I had, again, if I had this one to do over again, I would have included an iron terrace in my bench and pilot scale work that supported this design. And I, I think our design might have changed as a result of uh, the data that we, we saw in, that, in, in some, uh, a different set of uh, bench and pilot testing. So, what, my head hurts every time I look at this slide. The, uh, the iron terrace design variables that, uh, that we've identified, there's 17 of them and maybe there's more. Uh, what we know is that we, we need to start looking at uh, the wetted surface loading, grams per day per square meter. The flow velocities, fl low flow is not necessarily your friend. We want to look at the instantaneous iron concentrations. Uh, and, and again, what are your lit discharge limits? Do you, you really want to just, uh, do you have to hit a limit or you just want to save on lime costs? Whether you've got ferrous iron, whether you've got uh, cyanobacteria or algae, maybe you want to inoculate with the local materials, whether the site gets a lot of sunshine, whether you've got a lot of organic matter, the pH, et cetera. I mean, I'm not going to read every, all of them, but in essence, um, we, we, there are a lot of different things that are going to influence the design of, a, of uh, say, these iron terrace systems. And we don't know at this point which ones are the most important. So all I can suggest is that, uh, you know, we can, we can start looking at the, you know, the bench and pilot scale studies are going to be necessary for any scale up designs because every site's going to be different. Uh, but what we're really saying is this comprehensive model may never be, may never exist. Uh, but that shouldn't prevent us from, from uh, using the process. So we'd like to just keep on going, you know, what, do what Mother Nature's been doing for, for eons. And uh, with that, uh, I'm just going to open up to questions. Uh, and, and, but basically, though, if you do have any questions, just keep them to yourself. Wait till it becomes an emergency. Call me and we'll deal with the crisis together because I'm a consultant, okay? Um, and with that, uh, we'll open it to, to some questions. Do I need to stop, uh, stop any, sharing? Any questions for Jim? And you can see his email address on the screen there. So if you uh, can think of any questions, uh, you know, down the line, you can contact Jim at his email or um, his phone is on the list of attendees as well. Yep. Well, thank you, folks. Uh, we'll pass thank it you. on. All right, you're welcome. Uh, thank you, Jim. Me. Yep. Okay, so moving right along, our next uh, presenter is. Eric Cripain. Um, however, Eric has a slight change of his topic. Um, I'll let him explain that to you. So he's he's uh, not going to be talking about um, the Iron Terrace as listed on the agenda. But uh, like I said, I will let him explain that. So I will give him a brief introduction and then give him uh, the floor, so to speak. So Eric Crepain graduated from Pacific Lutheran University with a degree in business administration and finance. Uh, graduating during the 2008 financial crisis led him to a position marketing and distributing high performance polymetric materials used for soil stabilization. Over the past eight years, he used keen interest to better understand polymetric materials and their interactions with soil and their structure. Eric has field experience on large scale environmental cleanup sites with a range of contaminants, including heavy metals and radionuclides. In addition, he has experience in unpaved road construction, soil compaction, dust and erosion control. 
He is especially proud of the many relationships that he has forged with customers, engineers, suppliers, and consultants alike. His logistical experience enables reliable and cost-effective product delivery in remote areas around the world. So welcome aboard, Eric. Thank you, Susie. I'm gonna get my screen sharing here. Did that come up? Yes. Okay, and I'm trying to get this present. There we go. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you for having me. Um, you know, I've been coming to this conference for probably eight years now, and it's been, it, I learned so much. I love this conference. So thanks again for letting me speak. Um, I was, like I was uh, saying is we were going to do another presentation. Um, unfortunately, that presentation is going to be given at a later date, and, but it will be given. So um, look for that in the future. Um, so today we're going to learn about uh, copolymer systems and uh, the customizable nature of them, how they're user friendly, how easy they are to apply, and what our tortoiseshell product um, can address in the field. So, you know, what is it? What does it do? Um, copolymer systems are basically blends of chemicals. Um, these would be polymers. And what we're trying to do is kind of marry, uh, say, water resistance, flexibility, hardness, and those performance factors. And so you have to use different polymers to do that, as well as different additives to enhance the polymer's uh, performance ability. So uh, that's what we've done. And that's why we call it a copolymer system. Uh, tortoiseshell is hydraulically applied. Um, so you can use anything from like a water truck, hydro cedar. I mean, I've used backpack sprayers. Um, you know, they, the list goes on, but make sure that you're using the right size equipment for the job because trust me, you don't want to try to spray um, an acre with a backpack. That's just not feasible. So um, we have also... Uh, mixed and applied product out of totes um, in areas where you know it's difficult to access and so that's been that was actually a very effective way of doing that um, so tortoiseshell will stabilize soils and contaminants uh, what we do is we form a crust in the upper layer of the soil and this crust is capable of resisting strong precipitation and wind events and um, I'll discuss more of that here uh, as we go on. So um, since tortoiseshell is a polymer, it does create a continuous matrix. And so that's part of its advantages of being so good for erosion control. Um, it's also starting to be used as a way to create low permeability zones in soils where the polymer is actually mixed into the soil and compacted. Um, and then later on a top coat is applied and what you're doing is you're putting these polymer resin particles in the soil pores um, to help block the water out and and help sheet water off the surface. Um, so when applying a polymer um, in the environment it becomes really important that you test for uh, basically durability. And one way to look at the durability of a product in the environment is uh, seeing how UV affects it. And tortoiseshell is certainly one of those. And so what we've done is we took a QUV chamber and we flashed it with UV for 18.8 .8 days, which is the equivalent of about a year UV in Montana. And so what we're looking for is cracking and that sort of thing in the polymer. Um, and anything that would like we look at chain scission and stuff like that to, just to see if there's any degradation at all um, on this uh, evaluation we have found no degradation um, on the far left you'll see the picture of soil only um, so you can see these soil grains 
And now you're, if you look at the center one, you can actually see the polymer um, binding the soil grains together. Um, and that is a seven to one dilution. And then you, on the far right, you can see a two to one dilution. And again, the encapsulation of these soil grains and polymers. Um, and again, we found zero cracking after a simulated year. And um, the company Exponent uh, did all of our UV testing and uh, we really appreciated what they've done. So um, erosion control is something tortoiseshell does very well. Uh, we are used on many large soil stockpiles uh, to address sediment pickup uh, during precipitation and wind events. Um, you know, when you have to winterize a large stockpile, uh, this becomes very helpful in um, uh, basically if you, you don't want to vegetate something, but you want to keep the erosion down, you want to sheet the water off, and you want to keep everything kind of dialed where you left it, this is a perfect product for that. Um, so we've tested it in 4.8 to 6 inches of rain per hour, um, which is a very strong uh, precipitation event. And so uh, we did an untreated surface and we got 1,026 nephilometric turbidity units or NTUs. Um, and then once we had a treated surface, we, it went from 1,026 to 35. And that's a significant reduction, um, uh, 96%. So if you want to look at that in say grams per liter, that'd be 1.8 grams per liter untreated. Uh, and then the reduction is to 0.2 grams per liter per treated. And that's a pretty significant reduction. And as you can see here, um, it's a pretty good size slope. And what I'm going to do is do an application demonstration. Well, not yet. Um, so here's our erosion control results. Um, what you're seeing is, you know, the, the treated section is, is predictable versus your untreated, you don't know where your sediment load's gonna be when it, when it actually frees sediment. Um, so, you know, this is just a way to visualize it. So these are the actual effluent samples. And on the right, you can see the untreated surface. And on the left, you can see the treated. Um, so you can see it really takes the sediments out. Um, and, and again, that's why tortoise shell is so good for erosion control. So this is an application demonstration to show how easy it is to apply. Um, So you can see how uniform he's trying to get it, and that's really important. And they've done a really good job on this site. So moving along, um, tortoiseshell is very useful in tailing impoundments uh, for long-term dust control. So. It's creating that surface crust that's going to re, um, resist those high winds. Um, it can be applied to the slopes to help prevent those fine particulates kind of launching off those slopes. And, um, you know, we're, what we're seeing is typically our dilutions for, for tailings are going from like 12 to 1 to even 15 to 1 uh, dilutions uh, because our product is. Um, very consistent and we can be confident with those dilutions and in terms of creating a strong crust. Um, typically tailings aren't driven on so we consider it a non-traffic application and um, it's it's highly effective. And so for some of these tailing impoundments you will actually have some of these guys spraying them multiple times during the year um, without having new deposits because the dust control is an ample. So um, I'm gonna show another video of an application to the tailings. Um, again, super easy process where you put the water in the truck, add the polymer, um, 
drive around a little bit to mix it up and you're good to go. So here's the demonstration. So, uh, you know, this means basically a single application um, to take care of your potential dust emissions. And because of that, now you can wait until you put tailings back on top of it, wait till it dries out or gets close to drying out and reapply. Um, so it gives you a chance to do tailing management in, in a new way um, and a more cost effective way. So soil stabilization, um, I do, I've been working with a large municipality and um, they have a really big challenge. Uh, in this instance, it's for um, dealing with about 1500 uh, unpaved alleyways, but you know, that translates also into looking at uh, unpaved access roads and that sort of thing. Um, to, and so what tortoiseshell will do is it, it will keep the road as a hard pan surface um, that will resist raveling, washboarding, and potholing. Um, the city in this case was actually going back to some of these 300 foot alleys uh, up to nine times a year with a grader. And so they were spending a lot of money and they needed a way to maintain their roads um, more cost effectively. And so they look to us to start stabilizing their alleys and only come back to the alleys every two to three years um, rather than nine times in one year. So, you know, what we're seeing is a significant reduction in maintenance on the actual traveled ways. Um, these alleys will take trash trucks. Uh, the residents drive incredibly aggressively on these things. Um, this is us doing an application. If you look to your right, where those cars are parked, um, that's actually um, people's front doors. So uh, they are living on, their front yard is an unpaved alleyway. And so we wanna increase the quality of life for them as well. So uh, we applied this uh, surface and basically a day later we got an inch of rain and that's what the surface still looks like today. So um, even though we got a lot of precipitation the day after, uh, we held together very well. Um, so it's a very user friendly uh, product. So here, what you're seeing is we're pumping out of a, you know, two inch transfer pump directly into the truck. Uh, the product these guys are using is actually a pre-mixed product um, that we dilute for them in our plant to certain specifications um, because of turnover that we see on um, city crews. So another way you can do this is actually you mix it in a pug mill and then use a paving screed and you can just lay it out uh, using traditional paving methods without any heat or asphalt teens. Um, in this case, we had a large amount of off-spec asphalt aggregate, and so its sand fraction was too high to be using in asphalt paving. And so we were able to use it on this site and actually build a parking area uh, for the city to use temporarily while they redid another parking area um, on the same site. So this is uh, another application demonstration. And this is just to show, you know, uniformity and how simple it really is to apply. And again, these are just topical applications at this time.
So low and slow, we like to see the truck uh, not moving very, very quickly. Um, you know, we want to get a pretty soaking layer on that surface and then uh, we kick uh, rollers onto it and start rolling it down. So uh, tortoise shell will increase your surface compressive strength. Um, it will decrease the raveling. Um, it's cost effective for your temp roads and parking areas. And you know, that's where we overlap into mining is these access roads, parking areas. Um, you know, reducing your maintenance on those types of things can save a lot of money on, on the front end. So um, the treatments are quick and easy. Um, topical treatments are used to provide long-term dust control. Uh, you can eliminate daily watering and you know you could dilute our product out we've done applications that where we're treating yards uh, that have over 11 semis a day on them and we've been using you know 12 to 1 dilutions and just topical coats and that's been enough to deal with the dust and uh, makes it far more cost effective so um, on this particular one we actually uh, uh, striped on the material and so after sealing the surface, we were able to paint lines and um, this, this translated, translates into DOT work where if you have to reroute people off a paved surface, you can actually construct a stabilized surface, paint lines on it, delineate the traffic, and uh, you can reduce flaggers and reduce how many people might be hit by traffic. Um, these are types of things we have to deal with when we're doing DOT jobs. So um, this parking lot had an ADT of 280 to 300 cars a day. Um, it maintained its cohesiveness, uh, it rained on it, doesn't get slippery when it's wet, um, and reduces track out by over 80%. Um, out in the Tacoma area, which is where this is, uh, track out is a big deal and they do not want you tracking any dirt onto paved surfaces. So um, moving along, we have our strength result. Uh, this is for a native glacial till. So this would be using uh, natural materials that you may just find uh, on site rather than having to truck them in. Um, as you can see, we can use you know, a 1% addition and still achieve a high strength surface. Um, and, or we can use a 2% addition and increase the strength, strength slightly. So um, moving, and the reason these numbers are a little bit lower is basically because they're, they lack the angular aggregate that locks together. And so, when, I, when we do get angular aggregate, uh, using like a crush surfacing base course, uh, we end up with some pretty impressive strength numbers uh, where, you know, those aggregates lock together and then the copolymers really bind everything together and creates a, a very strong and durable surface. Um, in this test, we actually had to stop trying to break it with the soil breaking machine because we couldn't and we had to move it over to a concrete breaking machine, which it then failed at 1,644 PSI. Um, and I think it's really important to look at, you know, if you have an untreat, if you don't treat your road and it's just water packed, your PSI isn't gonna be as high as, you know, a bound surface. And so your durability is gonna go down and you're gonna have to do more maintenance on that road as a result. So. This is really a way to decrease your maintenance and increase the performance of your roads, or in this case, access roads, haul roads, and that sort of thing. So we are also used on highly contaminated sites. Um, these sites have some really, really nasty stuff. Uh, workers in these areas are in full rad suits. Um, so you can pick up plutonium on these sites. And so it's very, you have to be very careful. And so since it's so dry, even using water isn't enough. And so they've tried water curtains and that sort of thing. But what they're finding out 
is having a, a polymer like this, in this case, we're actually called a fixative. Um, that way they can spray all the structures and the soils down. And as that water evaporates, again, it's providing a binding capability rather than just drying out. And so that's why we're used for, um, you know, controlling contaminants like this. So um, also on container transfer areas where you are offloading hazardous materials, um, you know, sometimes these containers can tip because they dig into the soils. Um, and because of that, you know, you don't want to spill a bunch of hazmat materials um, on the ground. Then you have to clean it up. You have to bring guys in with rad suits and it, it becomes a big issue. So, um, you know, stabilizing container roll off areas so that you're safely offloading containers is another big issue. And, um, you know, we're able to solve that. We've also been used around this site. Um, there is free asbestos in the area. And so we are used any, basically when the soils are cleared, they need to tie them back down. And so they'll use tortoise shell to do that. So finally, um, you know, where is tortoise shell made and why that's important? Well, tortoise shell is only made in two locations in the world. And those locations are Los Angeles, California, and Tacoma, Washington. Uh, we run quick or strict QA, QC, and uh, we can pull our documentation off. Basically, you could read the lot number on the tote that you have, and I can pull all the information for that uh, particular batch. Um, you know, a lot of current practices in the polymer industry when it comes to these types of uses often use washout products, um, which some that may present liabilities depending on the additives that are used in the manufacture of the product. Um, and, you know, that product may have actually been rejected by an original buyer. So, you know, this can mean variances in active solid contents in excess of 15 to 20 percent. Um, tortoise shell has a variance of about one to three percent. Um, this allows us to be far more confident with our dilution recommendations and with the performance of our product. Um, you know, tortoise shell is well suited for the mining industry because it can address uh, multiple site challenges with one product and can be diluted differently uh, depending on the application it is being used for. So, you know. Relying on a manufactured uh, product that's got performance, reliability, and repeatability is very, very important. So um, with that, I guess, any questions? If you, if, if you'll be in the picture, if you keep standing there. <laughs> any questions for Eric? Oh, okay. Um, here's one. At a 12 to 15 to 1 dilution, what is the cost per acre to stabilize tailings? Sure. So uh, typically we see anywhere from $880 an acre to about $1,100. Great. Uh, let's see. That's the same question. Any other questions for Eric? Okay, uh, here's a question. How often do you need to treat tailings? Uh, well, if you deposit on top of them, obviously you have to retreat, but typically if you're not depositing again on top of them, it's a visual. Um, you basically just verify that the crust is intact visually and, and feel it and check for it. And if it's there, just let it go. And if you need to treat it again, then you need to treat it again. Typically we're seeing anywhere from a year to two years. Oh, another question. 
Any experience with the product in extremely wet environments? That is a good question. Um, you know, we need, we're a water-based product, so we need to dry to cure. So if we're in an extremely wet environment, that may be difficult unless there's a way to be able to dry out. Anything else? Okay, well, thank you very much, Eric. I appreciate it. Thank you, and thank you, everybody.